Welcome, San Red Beach Bible Church. We're so glad that you joined us online this morning. We're going to start as usual by opening in a word of prayer, so please bow with me. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this beautiful day here in San Mar Costa Rica. Thank you so much for giving us this awesome new church door to worship you in. Thank you so much for providing the technology that allows your people to watch and listen online right now. God, we know that you are all-knowing and all-powerful. And this coronavirus pandemic that we're currently in was already known long ago in the eternity of the past. And it's no surprise to you that this is happening right now. You are in control of this world. And we thank you for that. I pray for your protection against this disease and healing for those who do catch it. Lord, we know that you will use this to bring about your divine purpose, God, even though we don't understand it. I lift up this morning's sermon to you, God. Be with Jeff as he delivers this message. Allow your words to be spoken through him. We pray that you would help us to focus on you and give us spiritual understanding. Most of all, Lord, we, we just pray for your peace in this present time. Just bless this day. Bless this service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Good morning, San Juan Beach Bible Church online for now. I'm so glad you could join us this morning. Uh, we enhanced our sermon delivery a little bit from last week. Uh, this new format should allow all of you to better enjoy the word God has for us this morning. Um, if, if you still have any difficulty, leave something in the comments that will allow us to try to again make any kind of adjustments that we need to make. We want to make sure that everybody is, has the ability to watch the sermon online. So, without further ado, let's get started uh, by looking into God's Word. As we know, we always start the service every single week with the same two verses. It's when the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And that's uh, Hebrews 4, 12, and 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, all the scripture is inspired by God, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. San Marino Beach Bible Church, everything from the Word. Uh, this past week, I have heard the Word unprecedented and unprecedented amount of times. You know, we are truly witnessing a very, very, very strange time in history. And, uh, just to think about, you know, catastrophic events and stuff coming together, I'm reminded that back in 1991, a confluence of weather patterns collided in the, in the North Atlantic off the coast of North America. And, and, and by the book and by the movie, by the same day, created a, what is called a perfect storm. And it's a true story about the, uh, uh, the Adrian Gale, a fishing boat that went down in the storm with all six hands aboard lost. It was an unprecedented, monster weather event that caught the Adrian Gale and a bunch of other boats completely by surprise. You know, large bodies of water were often able with relative ease to show us our vulnerability. Uh, as humans to the whims of nature. Yeah, they are very, very good at that. And we find ourselves currently immersed in a sea of concern, possibly even fear, with another different kind of monster event of nature. But just as we have discussed over the last two weeks, events like this, just as Robin said in the prayer of the beginning of the sermon, was no surprise to God. He knew all about it in the journey past. And he uses all things for his purpose. Um, we see the sermon this morning is called The Eye of the Storm. And in fact, uh, he used these like events in the Bible for teaching tools to show small group of fishermen, no stranger. 
strangers to the power of the sea, what the eye can count on in the eye in this tough storm. Now, a lot of times we look at Bible studies and we look at them and we see that uh, they seem like it's just little stories, just little antidotes out of a, a, a history of past. But we have to understand that Bible stories are in the Bible for a specific reason. They're there to instruct us. They were there to instruct the people at the times and the things that were happening. Both gave them an understanding of who Jesus really was and what was going on in that day, and therefore give us understanding of what is going on both in that day and in this day, and how we are also supposed to understand and to look at Jesus Christ. Um, so we're going to look at these stories this morning. We're going to go over them very, very carefully, and we're going to understand what Jesus was speaking to us about in reference when he made sure, he is the word, when he made sure that these words were contained in his word. Because they're there for our instruction. But speaking first about his disciples, he went up into the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. He called those he desired. He desired from a large group of disciples. He called, you can see that in scripture, he called 12. He called 12 that he destined to teach, that he wanted to personally instruct and equip to take the message of the kingdom to the world. Let's keep that, that verse right there, in mind as we talk this morning about and take a look at what happened shortly thereafter. And let's read together this as well. It says, One day he went into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. Then a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. They came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? Being afraid, they marveled, saying to each other, Who then is this man? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. That's Luke chapter 8, 23 to 25. You know, most everybody's probably heard this story. But I'd like you to think about a few facts this morning that are contained in this version of the story or in any of the other Gospels where this story appears. Um, first off, let's take a look at the other. This was on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a very interesting body of water. It's the lowest lake, freshwater lake in the entire world. It is more than 680 feet below sea level, and it is contained within a rift between the Asiatic and African uh, plates. And it is way below sea level, and the mountains that surround the lake are very tall. They can soar more than 2,000 feet above the surface of the lake. Lake Galilee, or the Sea of Galilee, or the Sea of Tiberias, however you've heard of it, also is a very shallow lake. So any great windstorms churn it up and make it make the waves very, very difficult to navigate. Uh, all of them in the boat, everybody that was in the boat was a seasoned fisherman. And they all spent their entire lives, as we are told in Scripture, that their fathers before them did on this body of of water. So this must have been a whopper of a storm because they were scared. They feared for their life and they thought that they were perishing. Now I've seen a few videos about the storms that can happen on the Sea of Galilee. And, and indeed, they're, they're frightening. I mean, it's, 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 in fact, I think I have a picture here. Uh, yes, this is, this is a storm that is coming over the mountains, over the Sea of Galilee there, whipping up the waves and causing great distress for any fishing boats. And, and what also probably isn't known by the telling of the story is that these things can happen in the blink of an eye. They happen very, very quickly. And great storms can come right over those mountains and can cause real problems very, very quickly. You know, 
It must have been a, a monster of a storm. It must have been a monster of a storm. So I, I remember scenes from the, from the movie that we talked about, The Perfect Storm. Uh, it actually it actually was the, the very first movie date that uh, you know that my wife and I were on. Yes, I know some of you guys are going, all right, it's an Astro movie, and some of your ladies are saying, oh, isn't that romantic? But the, the theater was packed. We went very, very near the very beginning of the of the uh, uh, movie's release, and we had to sit directly on the front row. And so there was this massive screen right in front of us, and we were looking up at it and watching as the movie, you know, unfolded. And what I noticed is that the actors were doing a really good job of portraying, you know, an intense moment. But it went from them doing their normal things as fishermen. You know, they weren't really that concerned with it. And it went and it worked its way from being a moment that they may not have had any issue with until it was a fight for life. And the actors, like I said, did a really good job of, of, of portraying the differences between those things. And there came that point in the movie where you could tell that things had changed and that it had progressed from a point where they were just handling the situation to where they were in fear for their life. And I think about this story often. Or when I read this story, I think about this movie often. And I think about that point and I think about what the disciples, again, fishermen, at that point, it may have been where they clicked over from being able to handle storms that they had done for a long time to one where they believed that they were in peril. Um, they thought they were perishing. They thought they were perishing. John 16.30 gives us a glimpse into another aspect that we probably don't think about. It says this, it says, now we know that, and this is speaking of Jesus, it says, now we know that you know everything and do not need anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus knows everything. He knew everything and what was going to happen to him, and he knew when he commanded his disciples to get in the boat. He knew exactly what was going to happen. You know, he didn't stay on the shore and say, you know what, you know, probably ought to wait until tomorrow, but you know, I think a storm was brewing. No. He piled all of his items in the boat and he got into the boat himself and he fell asleep. He knew what was going to happen. He was very aware of what was about to take place. And he fell asleep. And not only did he fall asleep, he fell asleep to the point where even in the peril of this storm, he was still asleep and snoozing in the back. But he was asleep in the boat. They all thought they were going to die, and Jesus was comfortable and asleep in the front of the boat. Proverbs three twenty four tells us this: When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down, and your sleep will be sweet. Jesus was experiencing sweet sleep. It's just as Proverbs tells us: When you are in the hands of God. Your sleep can be sweet. It also tells us in Psalms 4 8 that in peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Understanding that God is in control, that when we lie down and we sleep, we are sleeping in the safety that is afforded us by God. Jesus had all the characteristics of a man. You know, he was tired. But he had what we find so hard to possess in ourselves. Absolute faith that God was in control in the midst of the storm. He had absolute faith that his father was in control in the midst of the storm. And after he rebuked the wind and the waves, he said, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Although they had already witnessed multiple miracles at this point in Jesus' ministry, this one was an important teaching, and they were about to embark on their own missions, their own missionary journeys, as we find shortly thereafter. 
talking about the, the twelve, and he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. The sick. We also know that God, that Jesus breathed on his twelve apostles, he gave them a temporary dose of the Holy Spirit. And they did it. They went out and they preached. And they came back marveling at what they had been able to do, that they were they had control over demons, and that they could heal the sick. He had given them that temporary breath of the Holy Spirit to accomplish what he wanted them to accomplish. And they had done miraculous things in his name with that dose. They had gotten kind of a little apprenticeship practice, so to speak. And so then some time passes, and more teaching takes place, and more miracles take place. Feeding of 4,000, feeding of 5,000 take place. And again, we find ourselves with them in a boat. It says this, Then Jesus commanded his disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of them to the other side. While he sent the crowds away, when he sent the crowds away, he went up into a mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was turbulent. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit! And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord! bid me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter got out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him. Say, truly, you are the Son of God. And we know from some of the other gospel versions of this story, you know, from, from Mark, uh, that Jesus saw them straining against the, source, the, 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 the storm from land. He was watching them from the land. Now, you got to think, you know, it's, you know, it's way back before we had a lot of lights and those kinds of things. So, more than likely, when it says it was evening, when he saw this, that it was still light. And we know the fourth watch is sometime between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning. So Jesus let them struggle against the wind for up to 9, maybe 10, maybe 11 hours before he went to them walking on the water. He was well aware of what they were going through. Even if he's not omniscient, being understanding that he would understand that, he also saw exactly what was going on, and he waited until he went to them. It tells us that they wondered, and they were astonished, and that they did not comprehend the miracles that they had just seen because their hearts were still hard. These are the same guys that Jesus had breathed a temporary blessing of the Holy Spirit into their lives, and they had commanded demons to lead people, and they had laid their hands on the sick, and they had been healed, and they had come back to Jesus marveling over what they had been able to accomplish in his day, and yet, they were still afraid and fearful. Jesus taught these twelve men a great deal about faith during his three and a half year of earthly ministry. Faith is one of the, the major words that were in use by Jesus when he was teaching his disciples. And therefore, because we have his word today teaching us. Um, but what kind of faith did they have at this particular point? That they were so easily frightened, so easily concerned, even after all that they had seen and all that they had been taught. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus was telling them this. He said, if a brother sins against you seven times in a day and repents, you must forgive him. And finding that odd, 
I think that, you know, I mean, this guy just keeps, you know, just keeps missing me. And I gotta, I gotta forgive him seven times in one day if he repents. If he just keeps doing it, I have to do that. And so they said, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Many will teach, this is a prayer that we should pray. Increase our faith, Lord. Increase our faith, Lord. Give us more faith, Lord. And they do not tend to read the following verses. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could tell this tree over here, hey, go up root yourself and go plant yourself in the ocean, and it would happen. See, it's not the quantity of faith that's in question. Jesus knew that it wasn't the quantity of faith, it was the kind of faith that was important. Because he called it a mustard seed of faith. And he said, if you have. If you have. Because they didn't have that mustard seed of faith that would cause that to happen. Now they had had it. But at this particular point in the teaching, they didn't have it. And he said, if you had a mustard seed of faith, you could. Because it isn't about us praying for a quantity of faith. Or give me a giant faith. To move mountains. No, we're working in a muscle to see of the right kind of faith. And I can do whatever. I can make trees go into the ocean. I can make mountains move. Because it's not about the point. It's about the kind. Later, those who were in the boat were with Jesus in the garden of the city for the last night together. He sang once and he said, Surely you are the Son of God right here. Surely you are the Son of God. When they saw Judas and the crowds and the temple guard coming with clubs and swords and flaming torches. You know, right there they were. They really faithfully stood in the right solid area around Jesus, right? But they all fled. Everybody ran away. It says one actually left his clothes behind. He took off. He left him. But all this scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him. Then they fled. And you remember Peter? Peter? Even if everyone else deserts you, I will not desert you. And before this event took place, Jesus told Peter. Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this day, during the night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. These were the men that Jesus desired to change the world. These are the ones that were responsible for taking the gospel message that they had trained for for three and a half years to the ends of the earth. These are the guys right here. And the rooster was the only one being who he was called to be. Everybody else was being a chicken. Everybody else was scared. But I understand this. I get this because human faith is frail. In fact, in, in, in most cases, when it gets tough, it's non existence. Yeah, but I have something, I have something that these track stars in hiding, these track stars, these runners, these deniers, these men who crouch in fear, just waiting for the authorities to come knock over the door. I have something. That, and you have something if you're a child of God. That they didn't have at that point. But it was coming. It was coming. This same group of cowards were about to make a miraculous recovery to the virus that is fear. Holy Spirit, they were going to get a permanent dose. Not a temporary dose, but they were going to get a permanent dose of the Holy Spirit. Just as each believer today in Christ has a permanent dose of the Holy Spirit. And after Pentecost, take a look at Peter, that same Peter that denied Christ three times, that same Peter that fled and left Jesus with the temple guard and the crowds and his betrayer in the garden of Gethsemane. We have a look at what he did. And he stood before the same group of people that condemned Jesus to death. He stood before the same group of people that he was 
were so afraid of just a short time earlier that he denied his Lord three times. He was so afraid of them that he would suffer the same fate that he denied Christ three times. He stood before these people, the Sanhedrin of Israel, and he declared the gospel of Jesus Christ to those people. And here, let's take a look at it. I quote, For we cannot help but declare what we have seen and what we have heard. And they told him to shut up. They told him, do not. You have to stop talking this. Didn't do anything at that point because they had performed a miracle on a man. And yet they told him, you be quiet. Y'all shut up. And as they left, they rejoiced because God had changed the situation. God had changed their fear into something quite different. All of the disciples after Pentecost were completely different men. We look in the annals of what happened to each and every one of them. Every one of them but John died professing the very thing that they had ran away from before. What was the difference? These men became equipped. They were now ones who Jesus desired. He had desired them from the beginning because he sees all things. And he had desired these men. Now they were the men that Jesus desired. Now they were equipped the way Jesus wanted them to be. They received the fear shot, the inoculation against fear. And they boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, we'll change the world, change the way we are today. Where would we be without the, the message that they proclaim in their life? What about you? What about us? What's the Bible say about us in this exact same situation? It says this, come to me. This is Jesus speaking to every single one of us. It says, come to me, you, all of you who labor and are heavy burden, and I will give you rest. What kind of rest? promise to give us the same kind that he had in the boat. Sweet sleep, rest in him. No fear, no concern, but a sweet rest. This is what he promises to us. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. And he was raised the third day to cover our iniquity, to cover our sins. is available to all those he desires. Changes you. Makes you different. Not that I have already attained or have already been perfected, but I follow after it so that I may lay hold of that for which I was seized by Christ Jesus. I love the way Paul puts this. I was seized by Christ Jesus. Only oh, he would seize all of us in the same way. And yet he does. He does the exact same thing for each and every one of us. He chooses us. He desires us. seizes us. Finally, for this, for to this you were called because, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. We, as Christians, are also likewise have been desired, chosen, seized, called for a purpose. The first part of 2 Peter chapter 1 says this, His divine power has given us all things. All things. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. excellence. He has given us all things. He has given us that shot of the Holy Spirit, just like he gave the disciples that changed them from who they were to who Jesus desired. It says he desired them, but he desired for them to be who they were called to be, who he had seized them to be. At the beginning of this sermon, um, we talked about what the eye can count on in the sword. 
You know, it can't count on our measly faith, our measly human faith. You can't count on that. We saw what that looked like on the apostles. It didn't work. The human faith that they were practicing before they got the inoculation of the Holy Spirit didn't work. It was not lasting. They kept going back to the same doubts, to the same fear, to the same ineffectiveness that had plagued them throughout Jesus' ministry on earth. But when he left them and they waited for the counselor and the counselor came, they were changed to a new way of thinking, a new way of acting. Because they weren't depending upon their own faith. They were not depending on it. You know, we can count on something different in the storm. And what we can count on is the I am of the storm. You know, because we know that the I am is either with us in the boat, or the I am is watching from afar, and the right hand of the Father is interceding for us from right now on our behalf. We know that the I am is with us during this storm. And he's there. The I am is there to give us the required faith to weather this situation today that we're in right now in any situation that presents itself before us. It says, Therefore, brothers, diligently make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly provided for you. Be abundantly for you. What are we supposed to do? What does it mean to make your calling an election sure? It means to stop relying on your piddly human faith. To stop relying on that which cannot get you from point A to point B where we need to be. Stop relying on the same faith that the disciples were relying on in the early years of Jesus' ministry. They were constant doubters. He had to ask them all the time, where's your faith? Where's your faith? Because they didn't understand. It wasn't about their faith. It was about the faith that he it's always been a faith that you I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, nor shall anyone snatch them from my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them from my Father's hand. We're in the midst of a storm, but you know we can have that mustard seed of faith. Quality of faith that clings to and trusts in the I am in the story. We can be like those transformed apostles. We can be different than we are. And stop worrying about what's going to happen. The coronavirus. Romans 8 28, super great verse in the Bible. It tells us we know all things work for the good of those who love God and to those who are called according to to his purpose. It doesn't say a few things. It doesn't say uh, some things. It doesn't say everything but the coronavirus. God is at work on human minds and human hearts right now as we speak. And we as believers need to fill the blanks. We need to fill in the blanks for those who don't understand the blanks. These next 11 verses that we're going to read, these are what follows. Romans 8, 28. We know all things work for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. These next 11 verses are integral in us understanding where we stand this morning before Almighty God and before His Son, Jesus Christ. And they should give us the ability to tap into our Holy Spirit that's right there within us and be able to understand that fear is also a virus. Fear is also a problem with us. It is a causal agent from sin, or it's caused by sin. Sin is the causal agent of fear in our lives. Hard, hard to hard to not be fearful in such times, but God calls us to not be fearful. And then he tells us this. 
For those in he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Whom is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died? Yes. Who is risen? Who is also at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life Neither angels, nor principalities, nor powers, neither things present or things to come, neither height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's an interesting list. It leaves absolutely nothing out. There is absolutely nothing if you are a child of God this morning. If you have Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit within you, there is nothing Nothing can separate separates from his love. We have to understand the bigger picture. Yes, there's a virus. There's a virus that is you know, messing with the world right now, causing craziness, causing shutdowns. And it can be scary to a lot of people. But nothing. Not this virus, not governments, not curfews, not restrictions, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. You know, you were desired, you were predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. I want you to think about that image this morning. We've talked about being conformed to the image of Christ a bunch. Let's look at the image of Christ in the middle of the storm, asleep in the boat. Even when the storm was life-threatening, there he was in the boat, in a sweet and peaceful sleep. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit this morning. We need to allow that to lead us to a bolder faith. Not a human faith, but a faith that is given to us and activated and intensified by the work of the Holy Spirit. We've got to let go of that frail human faith and allow that faith that is given to us by the Holy Spirit take over and create just like it did in the apostles wonderful workers in God's kingdom we need to be in calm in the storm you know this world may look a lot like a sinking ship right now and it does but you know what we are told that we cannot be separated from, from the love of Jesus Christ and we're not going down with the ship we will not go down with the ship our faith in Jesus will keep us from going down. So look up for your redemption is drawing near. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning. Thank you for the love that you show us. Father, we thank you that we can look at stories in the Bible and we can glean from them great truths. We can understand the things that you were saying, Father. So instead of us saying, Lord God, give us more faith, to trust you, Father. Give us a mustard seed of the right kind. Lord God, have your Holy Spirit stir within us. Cause us to have the faith that you want us to have. The faith that can move mountains. God, we thank you that you have given us your word for us to study, Lord. You've given us your comfort in this present time. As we said last week, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you're listening to this this morning, and you would like to have a personal relationship with him, my email address is the letter J, last name Savage, at samarabeachbiblechurch.com. Send us 
an email message. We will do the very best that we can to get back with you as quickly as possible and tell you about what it's like to have a salvation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell you how to get that done. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for everything that you guys do for us. Uh, blessings to you all. Stay safe. And stay calm in the Holy Spirit.